So welcome back, everybody. I wanted to give you uh, just a few messages before we move on to the topic this week. And uh, uh, you probably now you're familiar with the uh, website of the university where you can find the information. Uh, you have the teaching schedule. So if you subscribe to that service, you can get a text in case we have a change of classrooms and so on. We use extensively, uh, all information is actually put on GitHub. And this is the uh, site where I place basically all uh, lecture notes, exercises, and so on. Now, uh, concerning the exercises this week, there's just one thing I wanted to tell you, is that the exercises, I hope you don't felt overwhelmed uh, with five exercises, but the idea is that some of these exercises are going to migrate into next week. So if you didn't finish, I mean, there is no reason to, uh, to stress about not having finished. The uh, exercises, if you want to peep into these solutions, I do place solutions to these exercises. So you can look at the solutions as well in case you didn't have time to do it. Now, these exercises which we are setting up, they serve the aim of preparing you for the first project. So many of the things which you're going to write smaller programs for, they will actually be topics, the things you're going to program, they will actually be reused in the projects. So next week, we are going to have an additional exercise with uh, some uh, matrix vector manipulations from NumPy, which you will find handy in project number one. The, uh, just to guide your eye a little bit, if you uh, go into, uh, into the slides here and you uh, go into handwritten notes uh, and you click on 2022 here, there's actually a note to the analytical, I mean, the paper and pencil exercise number five in this set. So many of you uh, may be a little bit rusty when it comes to linear algebra and also in many of the basic linear algebra courses, it's very seldom that they cover things like derivatives or vectors and matrices. So if you felt a little bit at loss with exercise five, uh, there's actually an additional note here, which you can look up. And it actually contains a solution to the exercises there. Now, there's a reason why we put this up, uh, because as I mentioned last week, machine learning has at its heart an optimization problem. So optimization means you having to take the derivative of a multi-dimensional object. So you need the gradients. Sometimes you can do this by hand or other cases you may let automatic differentiation do that for you. But it's actually very useful when you want to build up your intuition to actually do the paper and pencil stuff. And then when you have the derivatives, the analytical expressions, it's actually uh, nice to write a program yourself which does this optimization. So in project number two, you're actually going to do that. So you're going to compare your own optimization where you take the gradients and you're going to compare that with, uh, let's say, what's built into scikit-learn. But it's, it's very useful to have this understanding of what enters the basic machine learning algorithms. So having done it once uh, with some simpler cases allows you to have this kind of more in-depth understanding of what enters a machine learning code so that you don't have this feeling of dealing with black boxes. So uh, if you have time, take a look at that. Uh, it's meant as a kind of uh, help in, in solving that exercise. If you then also go into, uh, there's a folder uh, on projects and exercises here. And uh, the exercises, you will also find a solution to the exercises for this week. So in case you didn't have time to look at it, I mean, feel free to look at the solutions. It doesn't solve all the problems for you, but it at least it gives you guidance on how you can solve them. Also keep in mind, this is a, just a, uh, a kind of, uh, I would say, uh, not exactly warning, but the, uh, the, the way the, the, the codes which I present in the lectures and also in these exercises, I mean, the codes I've written, I try to keep them as simple as possible. So some people may say that this is a guy who learned to write in Fortran. 
and you can easily extrapolate from my age that I actually started the program in languages like Fulcrum. Uh, but I try to keep them simpler. And that means that if you think that you would like to add some more advanced topics of Python, please uh, do not hesitate to do so. So I try to keep the programs uh, very simple, straightforward, not too many fancy Python programming features, but that is a deliberate choice because you guys are a pretty heterogeneous group from people which are very savvy on computing and people who uh, uh, need to refresh themselves about how to write a program. Okay, so uh, if you don't mind, if you don't have any questions, uh, I'd like to uh, move to the topics for this week. Uh, I'd also like to remind you that you have the Jupyter book here. Uh, but this week, uh, if we now just look a little bit at the topics, we uh, are going to look at uh, the, uh, uh, a little bit more about more than uh, least squares uh, with some applications. But then we need also to bring in some elements from statistics. And the reason is that statistics is something which really pervades this theme. So to have a kind of understanding of what some of these quantities means and how we use them and how we can interpret the results in terms of a statistical analysis is actually a very important aspect of machine learning. So I'm going to spend some of the time today with just a reminder of some important statistics concepts. And that is going to lead, for instance, to things like uh, the covariance, which is an expectation value. And we use often the covariance to define a quantity which is called the correlation matrix. And that's a very useful way, if you can calculate that one, to find correlations in your data set. You may remember from last week that I said traditionally machine learning deals with making predictions. So you have a model which you fit to the data. And when you have this model, you would like to find correlations in your data just to be able to say whether these are properties which have something to do with each other. Like we discussed the, uh, the prices for a house. If you're going to the uh, real estate market, it's uh, very likely that the size of the house has an effect on the price, right? So we would say there's a strong correlation there. So that would be a typical example. Uh, you will also find the typical reading recommendations. Uh, but before we... Uh, uh, move on with the, with the statistics, I actually wanted to remind you briefly of uh, what we did last week. So let me just bring up the Jupyter Notebook and uh, just quickly go through some of the basic ingredients of, of, uh, from last week. So the, uh, I hope you can all, can you all see well? Are the fonts okay? No problem with seeing? Okay. So the, uh, uh, one of the reasons why we uh, begin with linear regression, which some of you may feel, what does this have to do with machine learning? Because it's just actually us inverting a matrix. Now, the reason is that uh, we have a, uh, uh, the possibility to find the uh, analytical expressions for the parameters. As you will see later, we can actually calculate uh, and obtain analytical expressions for the mean values of the parameters beta, but we can also find an analytical expression for the mean, for the variance of the parameters beta. And when you have the variance, you can calculate the standard error and, or the standard deviation as we call it. And that's something which is extremely useful because then you can put an error estimate on the model you have made. So uh, it also has, uh, analytical expressions for the terms you want to uh, invert. So the parameters beta is actually easy to implement as we saw last week. And it links also well with classification problems which are coming after this topic. So I mentioned this with a gradient optimization problem. So the gradient here is pretty easy to program with ordinary least squares. And that means that you can build up some confidence that when you write a program for calculating the gradient using things like uh, stochastic gradient descent, which is one of the standard methods, you know what the, the answer should be. And that gives you confidence that what you're doing is correct. 
And then uh, it also allows us for uh, many, many other interpretations, which we're going to see by bits and pieces here. So the thing which we did last time, so we, uh, uh, if we just move away a little bit, uh, we made a model. Uh, we, we actually assume that the data which we have, so Y was the input data, not the output data, and X is the input, is now given by some model which we make here, this Y tilde. And in the specific case which we looked at last week, we assume that this Y tilde, the model, is given by a polynomial of some degree. And just to remind you, if you have 100 points, you can make up to a 99th order polynomial to fit the 100 points. Two points, one straight line, three points, a square polynomial, and so on. The uh, result then, just to quickly, quickly remind you, when we define these different quantities, we define a matrix, which in case we want to include all the points, it has a name in the literature and it's called the Van der Monde matrix. Uh, you can decide, and we opted for this way of doing the fitting by keeping the intercept. Now, some of you have already seen that when you use scikit-learn, scikit-learn normally takes out the intercept in the fitting. So you would have to put in a statement like intercept equal false if you want to compare a code where you set up a fitting problem with the intercept. We are coming back to that next week when we are going to look at uh, uh, what that actually means. Because when you are using some of these uh, black boxes of these libraries, they sometimes do things by default. And it happens that sometimes this is also not well documented. So we are going to discuss a little bit what it means uh, by uh, taking out the intercept well, actually, it's connected with scaling your data, but we will discuss that in more detail next week. Then, uh, when we went through the, the basic uh, machinery here, what we ended up with, so I'm just scrolling down here a little bit, I'm, I'm not going to repeat everything we did, is that we uh, ended up with uh, this uh, function, which is a function of the model, and this is the mean squared error, which we start with here. And this can then be rewritten in a compact uh, matrix vector form as this design matrix times the unknown beta, the transpose of that one. And then we want to optimize that function with respect to the parameters beta. So we take the derivative of that function with respect to beta. When we take the derivative with respect to the parameters beta, what we end up with, and we, we went through the derivation, so you, you can do this in terms of just setting up the individual components, or you can do it in a more matrix vector form, we ended up with uh, this expression here. And when we reorder, we end up with a final expression for a parameters beta. And this is uh, what we discussed uh, in quite some detail last Friday. Uh, today, we are going to look at some more examples, and we're also going to start looking at what happens when this matrix cannot be inverted. So that's a very important issue. So the, uh, this assumes, the calculations here actually assume that you can invert this matrix X transpose times X. So there are two ways or two very popular ways of circumventing this problem. One is actually called ridge regression. So have you heard of that? That's one of the methods. And then there's something which is also called lasso regression. We are going to go through the names of this and what they mean. Ridge regression was actually introduced without calling it ridge regression, but it was introduced as a kind of cheat. So if you have a matrix, which is probably non-invertible, what is the simplest thing you could do actually in when you want to invert that matrix? So suppose that you fear that the matrix cannot be inverted, you cannot calculate it or the determinant is equal to zero. What kind of trick could you do with the matrix to actually be able to invert it and get something which is different from zero? It's a very simple trick you can do. 
And you will see that in many old algorithms. You will see, for instance, a variable called zero, which is defined as 10 to the minus 10. If you add this so-called zero to the diagonal elements, then you can actually invert the matrix. So that was a simple cheat, which was introduced back in the 60s and 70s. Then later people came up that we can actually rephrase this in terms of a new function, which has a cost function plus some parameters. And it becomes, for those of you are familiar with Afro mathematics, it becomes a, becomes a Lagrangian optimization problem. And you can actually make some nice links with statistical interpretations as well, which we are going to see in the next weeks, which come now. But it actually started as a mathematical trick. And you will see in many of the old, old programs, if you dig a little bit deeper, you will see that in case something is less than 10 to the minus 10, put it to 10 to the minus 10. And then you can just move on. It's not correct, but it allowed you to run the comp computations. Okay, so the uh, thing which I wanted to do now, uh, before we start looking at some examples, so these are things which we went through last time, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, look at an example uh, which actually includes the uh, calculation of the correlation matrix. And there's a very popular example which you will find in many, many demonstrations. And there's a data set which uh, is already included in scikit-learn. And this is going to rely on us having to calculate something which is called the correlation matrix. But before we do that, uh, we need to remind ourselves a little bit about statistics. Is that okay? So I hope I'm not going to bore you with some quick reminder of statistics, but let's try to do that. Any questions so far? So let's uh, switch back to the whiteboard. Okay, so let's look at some basic uh, reminder of statistics. And I just wanted to bring up some of the, the basic concepts. So what we uh, have, we would have a domain of uh, so-called events. And this domain, I'm gonna mark that with D. A simple type of domain could be our input variables and our outputs. And we have x1, y1, all the way up to xn minus 1 and yn minus 1. So we keep this definition of the two vectors. So this is a typical set of events. That's the domain of events which we define. Now, we could assume that one of these or both of them could be stochastic variables. And that means that they follow a distribution. As you will see later, when we do ordinary least squares, we are going to make an assumption that Y can be treated as a stochastic variable, whereas X, which is our input, is not treated as a stochastic variable. Now, what you could say then is that this sounds reasonable, it sounds reasonable because you could think of you running an experiment where you define the input. So the input is well defined with no error. So you can now think of this domain here as consisting of stochastic variables and deterministic variables. So when we do linear regression, we always assume that the input variables are deterministic variables, not stochastic variables. So that's important. Now, when you have a stochastic variable, what you're assuming then is that there is a probability distribution. So let's just now stick with one variable just for the uh, sake of simplicity. So we would assume that there is a probability distribution and if we have a continuous the probability, we would typically call this a probability distribution function. So we would have something, uh, a probability P of X. So let's just stick with one variable to make life simple. 
And then we are assuming now that this is a quantity which has been properly normalized and it takes values between zero and one. And it's normally always normalized so that uh, at, at, uh, at, at the end of the, of the domain, it's always equal to one. So the, uh, these probabilities, suppose now X is defined inside a domain from A to B. Then what we would require then is that A to B of this function P of X, D of X, this is in case it's a continuous function. So this is for the continuous case. Then if we have the discrete case, we would have a sum over xi element in the domain of events x over probability p of x of i, and this is equal to one. So this is in case we have a discrete set of events. Now we're assuming here that we know the probability distribution or the probability function. We can then calculate the expectation values. And these are the moments of the probability. And these quantities are important for us. So I'm going to label an expectation value like this. So we have a moment of a variable X. And this is given as an integral A to B in a domain where the probability is defined and X are defined, multiplied with X of N of D of X. So this is a typical moment. And one of the more famous ones is the mean value of X, which we normally would write like a mu. Sometimes we put a subscript X to indicate that that's the mean value of the variable X if we have many. But now I'm just going to write it as that. Uh, for those of you uh, coming from, uh, let's say, chemistry, physics, or some other disciplines, you would often see this as written like this. That's another type of notation. I'm going to stick with the first one, because that's the one which you will often see in standard statistics textbooks. And this is obviously given by the A to B of P of X of X of D of X. Then, if you have a discrete one, then you would have a quantity where this mu is defined as a sum over i equal one, or let's just start with zero up to n minus one, which is a number of uh, possible events which you have. And then you have x of i multiplied with p x of i. So this is the kind of ideal case. Now, we wouldn't be doing what we are doing if we knew the probability distribution. If you know the probability distribution, then basically you have the answer to the problem. So our problem is actually, we don't know this function P. We may make assumptions about the function P, but what we have is a sample of expected values or a sample of variables. So we would have uh, in real life, as you might say, we would have the sample mean. And this is not the same as the true mean in this case. So the sample mean is given by a mu bar here. And that's going to be the sum over all the events which we have and the sum of i of x of i. So what this means is that the probability P is now replaced by an equal probability of finding all the possible outcomes X. This is what we will stick with throughout this course. We will in general not know the probability distribution. So we can infer from the law of large numbers, from Bernoulli's law of large numbers, but this is going to approach the true probability distribution if we have an infinity of measurements. But keep in mind that this is not necessarily equal to the true mean. So suppose these x's, uh, they do have a distribution that there exists a, uh, 
uh, domain, which represents, is represented by a probability distribution. What we will experience is that this may not be equal to this in general. Okay. So later we are going to look at the quantities like the central limit theorem, which is a very important uh, theorem in statistics, which says that some of the distributions in the limit of an infinite number of measurements, they will actually approach a uh, normal distribution or Gaussian. That's actually the one which is used to distribute your grades. I don't follow a normal distribution when, I, when we grade this course. So the, but some people actually tend to do that, follow that slave in a slavish manner. Not all distributions lead to that limit. But the thing I want to f uh, remind you of, uh, because this is important for everything we are going to do in this course. So you are going to have a finite set of measurements. You are not going to know what the distribution function is. That means that if we want to give an error estimate, we have to think of techniques which are called resampling techniques. And these are techniques which aim at getting a better estimate of the error in your data set. So we are coming back to that. But just keep this in mind. I mean, our life is dictated by the fact that we don't know the probability distribution. And in many cases, we would like to know it. But in standard machine learning, we are more interested in making a prediction and to find the correlations in the data sets. Now, another quantity which becomes uh, very important for us is actually the variance. So let's just remind you of that one. So we would typically write that as the var of a variable x. And that's given often just in terms of the Greek letter sigma. And if you have a continuous distribution, this is given by x minus the mean value squared multiplied with p of x d of x. So if you know the distribution, you can actually calculate this quantity. If you have the discrete case, this would be, so if we just put a parenthesis here and look at the discrete case, then this is given by a sum over all the events which we have, xi minus mu, and then multiply with p of x of i. What we will, however, suffer under is the fact that we would have to calculate the sample variance. And that will rely on also us having calculated the sample mean, which may not be the true mean value. So that means that in our case, the sample variance, which I'm going to put a bar on top, and later on, I'm just going to skip all these bars here. This is going to be given by 1 over n, and sometimes you will find an n minus 1. I'm coming back to that, but now I'm just putting up the standard definition here, and that's going to give in, be given by xi minus mu bar squared. So that's, and that is not necessarily equal to the true variance. So we, this bar here may not be the same. Now, there's another quantity which follows from the variance, which is called the covariance. Now, I just wanted to mention uh, one thing for you. And this deals about the probabilities because we are going to deal with multivariable functions. And then you are going to have a multivariable probability, a multidimensional probability, which means again, that if you uh, look at the, uh, something uh, which is called I, IID. So let me define that. So anyone who's seen that definition before? So anybody remembers who, what it means? So this is a standard uh, quantity which you will encounter when you do statistics. So it, states, it, it stands for independent and identically distributed variables. Okay? So what does that mean? So let me just write it out. This is an important assumption which is made about your stochastic variables. 
So it means that if you measure one variable, that should not be influenced by the other stochastic variables which you have. So this stands for independent variables, independent and identically distributed. So what does it mean? So suppose I have a, I want a probability distribution for two variables, x1 and x2. If they are independent and identically distributed, it means that this probability distribution can be written as a probability for x1, for finding x1, and the probability for finding x2. So this has an important consequence because it's going to mean that there is no correlations in your data set. And that means that this covariance, which I mentioned, which I haven't defined yet, is going to be, again, the roundest number you can think of, zero. And that's pretty important. So if you have independent and identically distributed stochastic events, then the covariance, there's no correlation between the data sets, is going to be exactly equal to zero. In general, there will be correlations. If you generate data with a random number generator, these are generators which actually don't produce true random numbers. They are produced by a deterministic algorithm and they will have correlations. So the next numbers will be weakly, weakly, only weakly dependent on the previous ones. So that's something you have to live with when you produce random numbers, for instance. But let's take a quick look at the definition of this uh, covariance. So the covariance, if we now take these uh, two variables, x1 and x2, so let's just write it like this, x1 and x2, if we have a continuous distribution, this is now given as a, an integral of a dx1, dx2, and then I have a x1 minus mu1, x2 minus mu2, and this is again multiplied with the probability x1, x2. And if we now assume that they are IIDs, so if this is the case, then this covariance of x1, x2 is now given by the same integral dx1, dx2. Now they would have the same mean value. So it says x1 minus mu, x2 minus mu, because they have the same probability distribution. So the, the mean value has to be the same, obviously. And then I'm multiplying this with p1, a p of x1, and it's the same probability of p of x2. And now you can see that this is x given by dx1 and x1 minus mu of px1. And then I have a similar integral over dx2, x2 minus mu and multiplied with px2. So without having done any calculation here, can you see what the answer should be like? So keep in mind, let me just give you two hints before we, before we start thinking. So if I have D of X, P of X, same probability times X, this is the same as mu. And also D of X, these probabilities are normalized to one. So mu is now a constant, right? So if you look into the integral here, mu is just a constant. So what do you get then? If you have identically distributed and independent variables, what should this covariance become? Zero, exactly. So this is uh, because you get the first term. This term here gives you the mean value. This is just the mean value multiplied with this integral. So this one is, act is actually exactly equal to zero. So this is a very important thing. 
If not, I'm going to put up the result. If not, what you will get then is that the covariance of this x1 and x2 is now given in terms of the mean value of x1 multiplied with x2 minus mu1 multiplied with mu2. And it's actually not so difficult to see that. And if you have the discrete case, so let me just bring that up as well. So for the discrete case, what you would have then is that this covariance, x1, x2, is now given by the sum over ij, and then I would have an xi minus mu1, and then I would have, and this should have a label 1 here, and this is xj2 minus mu2 here, multiplied with p of xi xj. So this is in case we, uh, and the result is going to be exactly the same, but this is now going to be in case we don't have independent and identically distributed variables. So if you have a independent and identical distributed variables, the covariance is exactly equal to zero. So what you could say now is that this measures some degrees of correlation, so some relation between variables. So if there is no interaction between the variables, no correlations, this is automatically equal to zero. You can rewrite this in terms of a, uh, of a matrix. And uh, you could now, uh, so one of the things which we can define, a little, a little, we are going to define this a little bit later in the lecture notes, uh, but let's now uh, move back to some other definitions. So these are the quantities which we are going to calculate, but let's now uh, remind ourselves of uh, uh, some other definitions in, in probability theory. So what we have is something which is called the joint probability. So we would have something like uh, the probability of finding A and B is often written as P of A, B. And I'm just setting up uh, uh, this one is also called it has another name as well. It's called the product rule. So A is a stochastic event and B is a stochastic event. And this is often written out. So I'm not going through all these kind of uh, statements. Uh, this is written as the likelihood of A given B multiplied with the probability of B. And this is also given as a in terms of the reverse relation. So for those of you who have taken a course in statistics, you've probably seen the product rule. That's a very important statement or a postulate in statistics or axiom or whatever you might call it. And it relates, so this quantity with a bar here means the likelihood of finding the event B given A. And this is multiplied with the probability of finding A. There's another quantity which is important for us. So this was a joint probability. Then we have the, what's called the marginal probability. We can sum away one of these variables because we would like to find the probability for only one of them. So we could now define, for instance, P of A. And this is normally uh, given in terms of a sum of uh, all the events B. So we have uh, A given B, and this is multiplied. So B is actually given by this uh, event little b, and this is multiplied with P of B equal little b here. So we are summing up. So if this is you throwing some dice, you could now think of uh, the outcome one, two, three, four, and so on. And they have a given probability. So this is called the marginal probability. And in many, many applications, you're just interested in the probability for one of these variables. 
and then you would sum up over all the other ones. So this is another important definition which you probably have encountered when you study statistics. There is another, there is also a uh, continuous version of that. So I'm just setting up the discrete versions. Uh, you also have something which is called the conditional probability. And uh, this is given in case now this P of B is different from zero, obviously. So we would have the conditional probability for A given B, which is now given by this P of A of B. That means the product rule divided by P of B. Now, if I now use this uh, product rule and the marginal probability, I can actually rewrite this in terms of P of B given A multiplied with P of A divided by this sum, where I sum over all the probabilities. So this would be the probabilities A here. So I would have P of B given A, small a, and P of A equal A. So this uh, denominator which you have here functions as a normalization factor of the probability. So the way you read this is the likelihood of finding A given B. And the assumption here is that you have a model for this and you also have a model for this. That's an important assumption here. This uh, statement which you see here, this equation, has a name and it plays the same role as Pythagoras in geometry. So this is a very, very important relation which we are going to use later. It's, it's a theorem after a, a, a vicar in, in England in this, I think it was 17th century. Has any one of you seen this before? It's a very important theorem in statistics. Base. Yeah, this is Bayes' theorem. And we are going to use this when we now are going to interpret later things like ridge regression and lasso regression from a statistical point of view. So this plays the same role, what you see here. This is actually called Bayes' theorem. And you can think of this as the, uh, uh, as Pythagoras in, in statistics. Now, you may say now that, why this? What's this useful for? So what I want to give you is a simple example. Suppose you uh, are doing uh, studies of cancer and you're looking at the outcome of a mammogram. So, and suppose now that uh, you have uh, uh, two types of events. A is the output from a, a, a survey, from, let's say from a mammogram, just to give you an example, mammogram. And this takes values zero and one. So one, you have cancer, zero, you don't have cancer, okay? So pretty simple, binary case. Then you have B, this is just the sad case, you have cancer, okay? And this is also something we will label as zero and one. Now, suppose you do now a sensitivity uh, analysis. So you have a sensitivity and then we're going to take a small break. So I just wanted to set this up because this shows you how you can use Bayes theorem to actually say that the conclusion I'm going to give you now is wrong. So the sensitivity of this uh, mammogram could be something like this. So if I take the probability of A, so the mammogram flags that you have cancer, given you have cancer, 
B equal one. So this is the way you should read it. So given that you have cancer, what is the sensitivity of the mammogram of you really having cancer, okay? Suppose this is 0 0.8. Now, what you may infer from that is that there is an 80% probability that you have cancer. But that's not the right way of thinking. What you should ask for is actually the quantity you want is actually P of B given A. What's the likelihood for you having cancer in case of a positive test? So just think of, uh, of these kind of wordings, right? So this conditional probability that reflects a likelihood with a given input. So suppose you have cancer, then the sensitivity of this mammogram has a certain percentage and it would flag that you have cancer. So some people, when they see the first statement, they would say, oh, I have cancer, right? But the question you should ask, what is the likelihood of you having cancer given a positive flag from the mammogram? Are you with me on that? So this is the way you can now can use Bayes' theorem to actually find the real likelihood. And what you will see in these simple calculations I'm going to do is that the likelihood of a positive test from the mammogram and that you have cancer is approximately 3%, which is much, much better than 80%. Okay? Should we take a small break? Any questions, feel free to ask questions. I'm going to stop the recording for those of you online. So, if we just look at this specific case, this example, if you're asking the question uh, the wrong way, you may actually be led to think that there is an 80 percent likelihood of you having cancer. So the question you should actually ask is, what is your likelihood of you having cancer given a positive test? So let's look at how we can use Bayer's theorem to actually get a uh, uh, estimate of this uh, sad outcome, which is not 80%. So let's make some further assumptions. So one of the assumptions we're going to make now, and this function, uh, which we have here, if you look at this one here, this is normally called the prior in uh, Bayesian statistics. And it's uh, a probability which uh, is normally based on your model for how you believe this data, for instance, B behaves. So what you could say now is that you could make a model for this B based on the likelihood in the population as a whole of getting breast cancer. So that means that you will simply take the whole female population in the country, if you're looking at breast cancer for females, and then simply divide the, the number of cases, the annual number of cases with the population. So uh, we could define what is called a prior. P of D is a prior probability. And this is the, uh, in the population as a whole, suppose now that in, in a given country, this is a very small population, so it's four per mil. So let's assume that. This is just numbers which I'm making up. Eh? They may not be uh, very realistic. Then the other thing we need to think of is that this equipment may have some uh, false positive signals, right? So we can have true positive, we can have false positive, false negative, and so on. These are also outcomes. So we could think that this equipment which we have, it flags that you have cancer or you have a tumor, but actually you do not have it. So B is the likelihood of actually you having a tumor. And A is the likelihood 
from the sensitivity of the equipment which you have. So let's assume that I'm just putting a number here. Let's let's just say this is point one. In the previous case, I said if case B was equal to one, I put this to point eight. So what we're going to use now is actually Bayes theorem. So if you look at the last number, you could think of that as a kind of uh, kind of error in the equipment. That happens. So what we want now, if we use Bayes theorem. We want the probability of actually having a tumor and that the equipment flags that this is correct. This is the quantity, this likelihood is the one which we want to have. This is normally called in, uh, in Bayesian statistics, it's called the posterior probability. And this is a normalized quantity. So in our case, this is going to be given if we use the theorem as A equal to one, and then I have B equal to one, and this has to be multiplied with B equal to one. And then there's a normalization factor in the denominator. And since I'm just looking at very few events here, or very few cases, I have B equal to one multiplied with P of B equal to one plus P of A equal to one given B. So this is the uh, false negative. A false alarm. And if we do that, if we just put in the numbers, we would have 0.8 multiplied with this tiny likelihood of prior. And this is given by 0.8 times 004 plus 0.1 times 0.996. And if I do the math correctly, this should give me 0, 0 0.3. So that means if the equipment flag comes with a positive flag, then there's a 3% likelihood that you do have cancer. So just inverting the question gives you an exit, which is a little bit better than 80%. So it's the way you ask the question, which becomes important. So this is a very, very simple example or how you would apply Bayesian statistics. Now you may ask, why are we mumbling about Bayesian statistics when we are not going to use it that much in this course? Now, the reason for this is that we can actually make some nice connection in the way we understand linear regression. So let's now bring in some further concepts. Uh, and this applies to uh, what we have in uh, this specific case with the linear uh, regression. So let's see how we can link this with linear regression. Now, we assume now that we have this set of events. So we have some x0, y0, etc., up to x n minus one, y n minus one. So this is the domain of events. Now we have assumed that x is not a stochastic variable. Uh, what we are interested in now is to find a probability distribution for y. So we are making uh, a model now, p of y, given this input data x and this parameter beta. So we, we would like to find a probability distribution here. So, uh, there are many ways you can proceed. In the simplest possible case, we are simply going to assume now that uh, this probability distribution is given by something which is called the maximum likelihood probability. And we are going to assume that these y's are IID. That's one first assumption. This is the basic assumption behind uh, what we are doing in uh, linear regression. And I want to just quickly remind you that we have assumed that y is given by some function f of x plus some stochastic noise. So this epsilon is distributed according to some noise. 
which is normally distributed with zero mean value and variance equal to one. So that's an assumption we are making about the data. Now, the other assumption we are going to make about the data is that this function f of x is something which exists. It's a continuous function. And we're going to assume that it's given by a deterministic function. So it means that the stochasticity comes from this random noise. Okay? So normally we would assume that this is a, uh, we have a model. Typically we have this design matrix X times B. And normally these are not stochastic variables. And then we can ask the question about beta. So in plain linear regression with ordinary least squares, we are assuming that beta, uh, we are actually, we are, not, we are not assuming anything about their distribution. So they could be given by a uniform distribution, but we are not interested in a distribution. So what we would say then, since these are identically distributed, it means that this uh, probability of y of x and beta, given x and beta. So here we can just put a question mark. We don't know yet. So we could think of them as deterministic variables, or we could just think of that there is some kind of distribution which governs the parameters beta. So then we are going to look at this as a product from i equals zero to n minus one. And then we have the little guys, so the P of i's, and this P of i's are given by probabilities y of i with a given x of i, and now I'm going to explain this kind of uh, compact notation here. So this x of i star here, beta, is actually given by a sum over j equals zero to this P minus one, and then I have x i j times beta j. So I'm using a somewhat lazy notation here, so I don't need to write the matrix vector multiplication. And I'm just looking at one uh, row element, which contributes to the final vector y. Is that okay? So this is just a compact notation which I'm using. And you will see this kind of notation in many statistics textbooks. So I haven't said anything about the distribution here. So the uh, thing which I would like to do now, and this uh, is a little bit about the philosophy. So what is most interesting? A maximum probability or as little as possible probability? So you want now to find the probability of obtaining Y, right? And you have this parameter beta. So you cannot tune X because that's fixed by your input, but you can tune beta. So when you want to tune beta, would you like to have a maximum probability for finding Y or a minimum or something else? The maximum, right? So now instead of having a minimization problem, we have a maximization problem, okay? So we want the maximum probability. Nobody's interested in zero probability, right? So we want to find a probability distribution, which obviously maximizes the likelihood for value of y. Okay, does that sound reasonable? And this leads to the maximum probability estimator, right? Or maximum likelihood estimator. So the, uh, what you will find in statistics textbooks then is something which is called the maximum likelihood estimators or estimator. And this is normally shortened to MLE. So we made an assumption that these are stochastically uh, IID types of events, independent and identically distributed. That's why we can write the probability as a product of the individual probabilities. This is again a model which we're making, okay? So we're assuming that the y's are independent variables and that the same distribution which governs them. So what we would find then is that we could actually do a maximization problem 
and this is arg max for the betas which we have and betas are elements of a vector with length p and then we have p and then we have our y's and given this x we actually don't need the x because that's just our input and as a function of beta now note now that we haven't made any assumption of a prior of a distribution for beta because in principle if we want to use bayes theorem there should be a p of beta okay now we just assume that this could be a uniform distribution so that just gives us a concept now later when we are going to link a statistical understanding of the ridge regression and Lasso regression you are going to see that in one case the betas will be given by a so-called prior which is given by a normal distribution and in the case of Lasso you would have something which is given by a Laplace distribution so you can actually model uh, a statistical distribution and then get in touch with the standard linear algebra expressions which we have been focusing on Now, so this means obviously that now we want to maximize a, a product. So this leads to maximization of a product. And that's pretty ugly, maximization of, so we would actually like to do something like this, d of beta of a product of i, of p of i, y of i, and then this x times beta. That's not so nice to do, right? But there is a totally equivalent way of rephrasing this, as an, which makes life much, much easier. What is an equivalent of maximizing or minimizing a product? There's a famous function. Exactly. The log, the logarithm. So we can, instead of maximizing the product, we can maximize the logarithm. And you will see now that if we assume a Gaussian distribution, that this actually becomes pretty easy. And it's gonna give us exactly the same equations which we started when we did linear algebra. So what we are going to do now is to make an assumption. And later, I'm going to show you that this assumption is actually true. So I'm just gonna give you a result before we have calculated that. So uh, the expected value, so this is something which we are going to do next week, but I'm just gonna give you the result, is going to be given by this x i multiplied with beta. What we're also gonna see, uh, so if that is the expected result, we're also going to see that the, the variance so I haven't done the calculation yet, but we are going to do that next week, is actually given by the same variance which we have for the noise which we have here. And so I'm going to call that, so in this specific case, we have a variance. We can actually replace this one with just a number which we call sigma epsilon. So this is going to be equal the variance of y. We are going to show that's the same as the variance of this normal distributed variable. So what we could assume then is that this y of i's, they are given by a normal distribution with mean value xi, this matrix multiplied with beta and the same variance which the noise has. That's the assumption we are going to make. Keep in mind these assumptions, right? So if we do that, instead of maximizing, so our so-called cost function, which previously was given by this probability of y given x and beta, and this was given by this product over the i's, over the p of i's, we can replace that one with a log. So we can the, solve the equivalent problem by simply taking the log and that gives us i equals zero 
up to n minus one, and then I have log of p of y of i given x of i times beta. Now, this is a monotonously increasing function. Uh, if I want a minimization problem, I can just put a minus sign. And then I have a minimization problem. So instead of a maximization problem. So if I now replace that one with uh, another C, and I just put it like this, this is going to be given minus C tilde or beta. And that's going to be given by minus i equals zero n minus one of log of t of y of i x of i times beta and then we minimize so then what we are looking after is a beta optimal which is going to be the minimization of beta of c or beta now, if we then make this assumption that these are normally distributed, so if we now assume that this y of i is given by a normal distribution of y of a, of a mean value, which I haven't showed you how to calculate because we're going to do that uh, either tomorrow or next week, and then this uh, variance epsilon what that means is that we get the following we get a distribution for each single of them if we take a normal distribution 2 pi and then we have the sigma epsilon squared and then we have the exponential and we have minus y of i minus this x of i squared and then we have divided by two sigma epsilon squared. So uh, keep in mind again that we, we have already made several assumptions about the data. We made the assumption that there's a normal distributed noise. We made the assumption that we uh, can treat the parameters beta given by uniform distribution. We uh, have made the assumption that x is not a stochastic variable. And now, uh, although I haven't showed you the calculation of these expected values, we can make the assumption that y follows a normal distribution. Now, if we do that, what we need to do now is to take the derivatives with respect to beta, right? So if you look at this probability and you take the log of that quantity, because now, so this would be our p of i. Then when we take the log of the p of i, we get then the following. So we get a constant term and we have minus log of p of i. So we would get a term then, which goes like the first term, which goes like minus. And then I would have log of two pi sigma squared and this is divided by a half. And then, no wait, not that one. And then I would have the next term, which then contains plus, and then I would have a sum over i equals zero. And now wait, wait, I, I now mess messing up here. Sorry. I was looking at the wrong line here. Then I would get a term which has a, there's a minus sign here, but then we have a minus in front here. And then we have when we take the exponential and then we have a, a, we get a minus sign here, minus, and then I take the log of the exponential. So what I'm getting then is just y of i minus x of i times beta squared divided by two sigma epsilon squared. That's the individual one. Then, since this is a, now a sum over the logs, which you see here, this specific sum here, if we now look at the, the full function we want to optimize, 
what we get then is that this function c of beta then becomes when we take the sum uh, we have these constants this is multiplied with minus because we want to do a minimization problem we have minus times minus and we sum this n times so this is n divided by 2 of log of 2 pi this sigma epsilon squared and then I get the plus here and then I have a sum of i equals 0 to n minus 1 and then I have my y of i minus x of i times beta squared divided by this 2 sigma squared epsilon and we've seen this before haven't we this is actually when I take the derivative with respect to beta when we do that so d c d beta there is no beta dependence here this is just a constant and then we want to drive this to zero the only beta dependence is here and this is exactly the same function which we optimized when we took a linear algebra point of view so this gives us simply when I now take the derivatives I'm going to get with get the same expression which we had before and I'm just going to write it in a more compact uh, matrix vector form y minus x times beta and that's the same equation which we got because the function which you see here is just the standard cost function which we use to define the mean square error so I'm not repeating the derivatives because we did that last week. So we're actually getting back the same equation, but with a statistical interpretation. Now, when we are going to look at Lasson ridge regression, you will see that the probability for beta can then be modeled with either a normal distribution or it could be modeled with a Laplace distribution. So you can derive the same expressions from either linear algebra without thinking of statistics at all or you can derive it from a statistical interpretation and this is a nice thing with linear regression that you can actually see the equations from two different points of view and that links you immediately with a statistical data analysis so the assumption now is that these y's are given by a normal distribution the uh, Ys have a noise which is normally distributed which is made as an assumption in the model but we haven't looked at in detail at the probability distribution for the parameters beta but this is actually something which Gauss did back in 1850 something so they both derived it from a linear algebra point of view but also from a statistical interpretation point of view there's by the way a legend on how uh, Gauss actually cooked up the Gaussian distribution. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So Gauss was a professor at the University of Göttingen. And in those days, the university worried uh, about the uh, pensions. And many people worry about pensions. And the thing is that many of these older professors, these old farts, they, they tended to uh, marry younger women often 30, 40 years younger than that. And obviously the spouse would outlive the old guy, right? And that uh, made universities fear that they wouldn't be able to have a sustainable pension fund. So Gauss then went into the data and tried to look at the age distributions. And that's how it came up, according to legend, to the Gaussian distribution. I mean, when you see what some of these guys did, I mean, you just, it's just amazing. They, they did everything. It's, this is a kind of legend. It may not be true. I mean, I like it anyway. Okay, so, so this was about the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, statistical background. Now, what I wanted to do now is actually to go back a little bit to the uh, Jupyter notebooks, and we are going to look at some examples. And we are going to, uh, one of the things we are going to calculate is actually the correlation function. And this correlation function is based on the covariance. 
So it's the only difference between the correlation function and the covariance is that you divide by the variance. So you will get one along the diagonal, so the correlation of the covariance matrix. This is extremely useful because it tells you a little bit about which data points are correlated less or more. And it serves also as a quick way to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. Suppose your problem has 100 features and some of them may just be irrelevant and you want to make a model with perhaps only five of them. So one of the things you can do then by the eye is just to study the correlation matrix. And you could say that if there are data which have basically no correlations, we may just skip them. So let's see how we can use this kind of uh, a little bit more ad hoc way to parameterize housing prices. So there is an example in the, in the Jupyter Notebooks here and for the weekly slide this week, which I actually wanted to go through a little bit. And so let's just bring back the, uh, the notebook here. So the, uh, this is a housing data which is uh, uh, in, baked in into scikit-learn. So that means that we uh, don't need to worry too much about setting up the data ourselves. It's just already ready. You can just split it in train and test as we discussed last week. And as you see, the, uh, it contains a lot of uh, different ways to classify uh, a house. And then you want to see whether some of these parameters have a strong influence on the price or not. So clearly, as I said, uh, this property number uh, six, average number of rooms, uh, is something which you may expect to have uh, quite a, a, an influence. Uh, so what we are going to look at now is the uh, uh, number 13, this feature, and we're going to see if we can make a simple model for the median value of the house. And we are going to find out which of these parameters uh, are more correlated than the other ones. So that's, a, that's actually one of these kind of intuitive ways we can start to analyze a data set. And if we want to make a fit on, let's say, the median value based on the number of rooms. Uh, there are also other properties. I mean, in the US, this is unfortunately very strong. The percentage of layer, lower status of the population that clearly affects housing prices. So the, if you just go through here, uh, there's another, I use this to also point to software, which is very useful. So Seaborn is a library or package in Python, which allows you to visualize uh, uh, data in a very nice way with the, uh, uh, what do you call it now? I mean, um, the words escapes me. Uh, uh, the, the coloring of, uh, of the data according to whether strong or weak. I don't remember the word for it now. Yeah, thanks. Heat map. So uh, Seaborn is a very nice software here. And then we import the data set, Load Boston. And what this actually does for us, Load Boston here, it sets up the uh, design matrix for us. So, and it sets up the output as well. And many of the uh, more popular data sets are actually included in scikit-learn. So people have actually done project number three by using data sets from scikit-learn. The thing which is nice with that is that there's a lot of scientific literature you can compare your results with. So that's a fully viable uh, approach to project three. Then uh, I'm just going through here. Uh, I'm setting in uh, different keys here. So you have uh, different features. I'm gonna run this one again. And then I pre-process the data just to see if uh, there are missing data sets. In this case, the data set has been pretty well trimmed, so the, everything is fine. And then I want to visualize the data here. And what you will find here is the uh, median value for the houses. And this is just the, uh, the, uh, the number of houses which you have. So typically the median, median value is around something like, these are all data actually is on $20,000. And uh, then uh, when you have set up the data, you can calculate this correlation matrix. And this is the quantity I wanted to focus a little bit on. So let me see if I can squeeze it in here. Yeah. 
So as I said, this data set, there used to be a pointer here. Let me see. No, it has disappeared. Now, if you look at the data set, so the correlation matrix is a covariance matrix with the variance divided. So which means that on the diagonals, you will have one. Now, if you look at the last column and the last row, this is the median value. You can see now, so this correlation matrix takes values from minus one to plus one. The covariance can actually have very large values. So this is actually a scaling of the covariance. Uh, we are coming back to these quantities in more detail later. So if you don't feel as of now, everything clear about the covariance matrix, I mean, you will get the proper definition a little bit later. So what you see here is that the median value, the last column, the last row, has a strong correlation with the uh, lower status of the population, unfortunately. So that means that the median values are strongly correlated with what kind of people live in certain areas. And you see also, if you move up a little bit, you see this acronym RM, that's the number of rooms. And you will see that the median value is also strongly correlated with the number of rooms the house has. And then all the other ones uh, are more important or less important. So what does this mean? Now, what it means is that you could try to make a model. Suppose somebody told me that linear fits is the best you can do. And now I want to fit the uh, median price with the number of rooms the house has and just make a model for that. So you could make a linear regression model with a linear fit. And then you would pick one of these variables, which is more correlated with the median value. You see the picture? So you're trying to find out which entries are more correlated. We pick the median value because that's the quantity we are interested in, what's the median price. And we want to find which parameters influence it the most. And then we say, okay, we find these two parameters. And now let's try to make a linear fit and just see if it works or not. So this is just a way to make a model. It may be good or it may just be bad. Uh, you could also make a more complex model where you try to fit all these features on the median value. That's also possible. But let's make things pretty simple. So what you would get then when you've done this, so you could now try to plot, and you can see here, this is the median value. Uh, these are the data points as a function. This is just the raw data. So you could take the lower status of the population, and then you could take the number of rooms, and you could be tempted to say, hey, I can draw a straight line here and just try to fit the data. That's the simplest possible thing you can do. Now, the reason why I bring this up also is to bring up something which will come later, uh, which is called principal component analysis, where this correlation matrix becomes extremely important. And you can actually, instead of this me doing this by the eye, you can actually automatize it and reduce the dimensionality of your model. Because suppose now that you are doing, again, cancer research, and you're looking at the DNA, and there may be something like 100,000 features you want to scan. Clearly, this can become quite a lot. Then what you could do is to try to find out whether there are some, some of these features which have a strong influence on that type of cancer. And then you would make a model based on that by reducing the dimensionality, perhaps from 100,000 down to 100 or 200. This is called principal component analysis which is a dimensionality reduction problem. This is what we're doing here, but we are doing this in a, in a somewhat, how to say, by the eye way, right? We're just looking at the correlation matrix. But so it's a way of gaining a, an intuition about how you can deal with your data. And then uh, you can run this, uh, you're setting up a pandas array, and then you're making a fit here. So I'm splitting things into train and test as you discussed in the exercises. So I leave 20% of the data to test. So I just run it through here. So this is the number of data which you have and dimensionality of the, of the matrices and vectors. And then I simply run through scikit-learn and I make a prediction. 
And you can see now that the, uh, the root mean squared error for the training set, so it's not exactly an impressive one. And then for the testing set is roughly five. And when you make the, the, uh, the plot, uh, you can make a scatter plot of the, uh, of the Y test versus the Y prediction. And you will see that there's still a pretty large scatter here. But I mean, uh, the, uh, the whole point of this uh, simple uh, data set was to try to uh, find a way to parameterize the median value in just in terms of one or two of the features. And we would often go along these kind of lines when we have a big data set and we want to get a rough picture in the beginning. So the quantity we would calculate is actually this correlation matrix. And that gives us already a lot of information about which features may be more important and which features may be less important. So let me see what, it, yeah. So this was just about the pre-processing of the data. So what I wanted to, uh, uh, and this is something we are coming back to, uh, and you've been looking at that in one of the exercises, and one of the things you saw in one of the exercises. Uh, so how many of you were able to reproduce figure 211 in uh, Hasty's textbook? Okay, so uh, one of the things which we uh, uh, can do and which we are going to see. So this is the example which we had in the exercises. So this is famous figure 211 in Hasty et al. So let's just run through this data set here. And let's now just look at the, uh, so what I'm doing now is to have 30 data points. And I'm looking at a polynomial of degree 15. And I'm making a fit to this function here, which is an exponential with x squared plus another term, which goes like x minus two squared. So essentially this is a function where I have a, a, an exponential. And if you think of the Taylor expansion, this is actually an infinite Taylor expansion. So I'm just making a polynomial fit to that function. So we could also take away, let me take away, we can take away the noise so we can keep the noise. So this is up to, up to you. And I'm splitting things into uh, uh, test and train. And I'm using a functionality in scikit-learn, which allows me to do a polynomial fit. And I use linear regression. I keep my intercept in my design matrix, which I've made up. And then uh, what I'm doing now is to simply calculate the test error and the training error. And what you see now is a typical situation. So you, you have a test error. So if we now reduce it a little bit, suppose we reduce the dimensionality of the polynomial degree to 10 and just rerun it. What you would see now, if you look at the test and train data, the train data, your mean squared error, which is plotted here, becomes better and better because you're making a better and better model. So this is a function of the mean squared error as a function of the complexity of your model. And you know that when you have an exponential, uh, the Taylor expansion really begs for uh, an infinite po polynomial, right? So that means that my training data should become better and better. But then uh, what you see now is that at a certain point, this uh, test data, which were not included in the training, uh, starts to show some kind of strange behavior. In textbooks, what you will see are normally very smooth and nice curves. With your real data, it will never look like a smooth, nice curve. I mean, the training means squared error is going to follow a nice behavior normally, but the tests can jump a little bit. But what this tells you is that you're reaching a region where your polynomial degree may not be the best fit to the data you have. Now, the thing, the reason why I bring this up is that this result depends on the data you have, on the amount of data. So let's see what happens. And this is one of the, uh, in that exercise, which you have for this week, and you can also look at next week. If I now go to 100, what you're going to see then is something like this. So that changed totally, right? 
So keep this in mind because the data you have are, as we said last week, the data you have. And in many cases, you cannot get more data. Here, in this vanilla example, I can just generate as much data as I want. And then you can illustrate this because sometimes you may see this behavior. And in other cases, you may actually have an optimal polynomial for the fit. And beyond that, you're entering the region of overfitting. And these are things which are things we have to worry about. And we are going to look at this uh, in more detail next week, in particular in connection with what is called the bias variance trade-off. And that's why we needed this kind of statistics review, which we had in the beginning here. Tomorrow, we are going to look more at the mathematics of the region regression and Lasso regression. And then next week, we come back to the statistical interpretation. And we are going to look a little bit more into detail how we can interpret many of these quantities from a statistical point of view. So I hope you can forgive me if I jump a little bit between plain linear algebra and the statistical interpretation. So I'm just throwing at you many concepts. So that means that in case something is unclear, never, never hesitate to ask questions, okay? Never, promise. Okay, guys, I propose we stop now. Feel free to ask questions. I'm gonna stop the recording. And as last week, I'm gonna upload them. And it takes roughly 10, 15 hours to generate the subtitles. So if you can live without subtitles, the video should be online in short, short time. Okay.